Hello, New York City. Hello. It's Brooklyn in the house. Listen, this is a forum, not a funeral home. I want people to be live and happy. I want people to be happy that we're alive and we're in this movement. So I need you to repeat after me. Hello. 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 Howdy, 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 ho. Howdy, 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 ho. Hee, 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 hee. All right, I don't know about show business for some of you, but we are going to discuss revolution and we are going to discuss the revolutionary role of the queens that I am humbled to be in the presence of tonight. I'm going to give a brief description and then each one of them is going to come up and give an opening statement before we get into the actual questions. Um, it's not lost on me that this is a man doing this, so I told people that at some point when you have an all male panel next time on Left Forum, there will be a woman standing right here telling these men something and organizing the panel. Thank you very much, Left Forum. Tithi Bharacharya uh, teaches Southeast Asian history at Purdue, um, excuse me, South Asian history uh, at Purdue University. She is a longtime activist for Palestine and writes extensively on Marxism and gender. She is a national organizer for the International Women's Strike. Please put your hands together for Tithi Chinzia <laughs> Aruza. Uh, teaches philosophy at the New School in NYC, and she is a feminist and a socialist activist. She is the author of Dangerous Liaisons, uh, The Marriages and Divorces of Marxism and Feminism, and she is one of the national organizers of the International Women's Strike on March 8th. Make some noise for Chinzi. <laughs> Give it up in the back, don't be shy. When you invite someone to your house, you gotta make them feel loved, come on. L.A. <laughs> Kaufman is the director of Direct Action, Protest, and the Reinvention of American ra Radicalism. She has spent more than 30 years immersed in radical movements as a participant, strategist, journalist, and observer. Um, Kaufman was the mobilizing coordinator for the huge New York protests against the Iraq War in 2003 to 2004. Her writings on American radicalism and social movement history have been published in The Nation, N1, uh, The Baffler, and many other outlets. Please make some noise for L.A. Cop. Nancy Romer is a climate and food justice activist. Uh, she was professor of psychology at Brooklyn College for 42 years and was active in anti-racist feminist union and anti-war organizing at CUNY. She was the founder of the Brooklyn Food Coalition and has traveled extensively and written about the campesinos and the agricultural movements in South and Central America, the Indian subcontinent, and the U.S. Please make some noise for Nancy Roma in the building. If anyone's wondering why I'm talking about them like I'm introducing a boxer, it's because these women are fighters, all right? Did you forget that? I'm introducing them as warriors because that's what they are. That's what this movement needs, and if you're gonna take some inspiration from a warrior, take it from an elder, from a, a, from a woman, from a person that doesn't have the same privileges that you do. That is an extensive part of learning. Thank you very much. And the last but not least, we are bringing them. Sorry, stupid phone. Last but not least, Madonna Thunderhawk is a member of the Uenumpa, right, uh, band of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, and is grandmother to a generation of Native American activists. She was an original member of the American Indian Movement, uh, a co-founder of the Woman of All Red Nations, WARN, and is currently the Lakota People's Law Project's principal organizer and tribal liaison. Madonna has been featured in several documentary films, including the recent PBS, We Shall Remain. Through her work, Madonna builds alliances and support for child welfare among South Dakota's tribal leaders and communities. Make some noise for Madonna Thunderhawk in the building.
coming to the stage first to give a, an introduction because they're going to go down the line. Make some noise, please, for Nancy Roman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Um, over the last year, the power of the right has fostered vindictive chaos. The only positive outgrowth has been a vibrant resistance movement that stands on the shoulders of the most important ideological, cultural, and political movements of our time. The indigenous movement, Black Lives Matter, climate justice, and the rights of immigrants, women, and LGBTQ people. None of the new resistance would be possible without those cornerstones of consciousness and organization. In the last year, hundreds of thousands of Americans have been drawn to movements, local and national, spontaneous and well-planned. Many have never actively participated in any political action before. Finally, they recognized how very much they had to lose. But the truth is that we have been slowly losing for decades on labor rights, on human rights, on the environment, on preventing US wars and imperialism. And the crises are mounting. The neoliberal regime was so hated by the American people, whether they fully understood it or not, that it resulted in Trump's election. The Bernie campaign ignited an intense fire for progressive change. And if neoliberal Democrats had not stabbed him in the back, we might have a President Sanders to push further to the left. Bernie's social democratic rhetoric fired up an enormous amount of dormant political energy. It taught us something about the power and potential of joining movements together into a whole cloth, how the big picture makes sense of the specific fights. We are now facing crisis. We are burning our species out of existence with toxic, wasteful, unlimited growth and militarism. The capitalist model of continuously expanding growth via the exploitation of workers, resources, and consumers, creating new markets without any concern for their effects on planet Earth, is driving us to the brink. Inequality and environmental degradation go hand in hand under capitalism the result of total disregard for anything beyond the profit and power of the rulers. How do we address the many issues of oppression together? How do we join these issues into a whole movement that sees solidarity and shared effort as the prefiguring of a new world? A world we want for our children, grandchildren, for seven generations ahead. We must build a movement now that recognizes the broad variations of oppression and their connections to each other and does its best to heal the wounds of an exploitive society and culture. The starting point is to face squarely the fact that we will live in crisis for the rest of our lives. We can no longer just be observers commenting on all of this. We need to face that our time, energies, and resources must focus on the existential crisis of our people and planet. We don't have the moral or the political right to step aside and let others do the work. Every one of us is needed. That doesn't mean that life is just one long meeting, but it does require each of us to see where we can become effective and active as possible and how we can advance a culture of activism in our workplaces, neighborhoods, faith organizations, friendship circles, and families. We are in the middle of a war on our environment, on our futures, on our lives, and we must fight back. On the ground, we must use every tool we can muster. Resistance is brilliant, inspiring, instructive, important. Standing Rock taught the world the power of community, of indigenous tradition, of cooperation and strength, of protecting Mother Earth. Black Lives Matter taught us the strength and power of youth, of women, to confront the historic and continued monumental shame of American history and culture. Immigrant movements taught us the power of community and hope. LGBTQ struggles taught us the power of love. All these movements 
show us how we are living in a rotted system that must be changed, then that the only way to start the process of radical change is through organizing on the ground, around the nation and world, in person, online, through solidarity of every possible sort. Yes to resistance, yes to electoral work, yes to mass demonstrations, yes to sectoral work in unions, in communities, in workplaces, in faith organizations, whatever shape it takes that raises the specific issue within the big framework. We do not have the luxury of time ahead of us. Climate scientists tell us that we have 10 to 12 years to make the needed massive changes in our economic and personal practices to avoid the tipping points from which we cannot return. The process humans would endure once we are past those points would spell increased misery, fear, hunger, disease, and more, especially for the most vulnerable people with few resources. To be effective, to be able to change the course of our nation and our planet, both sorely needed, actually required for survival, we need to bring those strands of the movements together to create a shared, overarching, and coordinated strategy for system change. It may not always look like system change. It may, be demand, it, it may demand reforms in the present system, but reforms that would create transitions to deeper changes or expose the system's inability to provide. Getting corporate money, or any big money, out of politics along with democratizing election laws would be such transitional demands. It won't completely change capitalist elections, but it would dramatically diminish the power of the capitalists. We could be demanding a democratized energy system that would break down the control of the big energy corporations and create and distribute community-generated renewable energy through democratically controlled community grids. We could demand the return of all historic indigenous lands previously stolen from Native American peoples, and so on, from improved social, social welfare systems to workers' cooperatives to community-based law enforcement to breaking agribusiness control by advancing small-scale production of healthy and climate-cooling food. And we could protect our planet through the democratic direction by those most affected by climate change, rising waters, extreme weather, and food crises. Capitalism cannot save the planet because its motor force is profit created by constant growth through the exploitation of workers and natural resources. These campaigns will only be successful if they hold the health and happiness of the people and planet first and foremost. We must learn to respect each other and see that the social and psychological scars of an exploitive society can only be healed by love and shared purpose. We will learn from each other by acting together, by relying on support from one another, by respecting the strengths that each person, each organization, each movement brings to the fight. If we want a democratic society that serves its people and Mother Earth, we must create organizations and movements that do the same. We really don't have a choice. We can grab the chance to turn our collective future around, or we can turn our backs and let the rumble toward destruction continue. I am scared, but I am also excited. We always had a world to win, but now the choices before us are starker than ever. If we don't change our economic system, if we don't organize our people now, if we don't build a complex and multifaceted movement to make this happen, our future will be brief. Homo sapiens will have been a 100,000 year blip of intelligent beings who destroyed themselves. Let's make sure that does not happen by digging in now. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Right now, I would like to bring on Tithi Bhattacharya. Make some noise for Tithi Bhattacharya, please.
Okay. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to talk about the March 8th International Women's Strike. It is a real honor to share the panel with uh, my fellow panelists and comrades. Um, I want to talk very briefly, um, because Nancy has given us such a broad uh, view, I'm going to sort of uh, take off from there and talk very briefly about the International Women's Strike of March 8th and what sort of uh, role it played in the overall canvas that Nancy uh, laid out for us and why uh, some of us got involved in, um, in organizing uh, such a, an effort in the United States because it was a global effort. Why did we um, uh, get involved in organizing it here in the United States? So before I start um, with what March 8th was about and um, why we got involved, I want everyone in the room to raise your hand if you've ever seen a Girl Guide cookie box. Have you seen the box that carries Girl Guide cookies? Yes? Okay? Okay. Everybody remembers the Girl Guide cookies, right? So, Girl Scout, Scout cookies. Okay. So, I'm not... Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Girl Scout. Okay. That's why it's called in America. Okay. I keep forgetting. Okay. Girl Scout cookies. Okay. You know the cookie box? Great. Wonderful. Okay, so, and you know at a certain time of the year they come um, coming and knocking on your door to sell the cookies, which is great. You should look at the box next time the Girl Scouts come around. You should look at the box um, because some of the things, I wrote them down, uh, that the box says that the little girls are going to learn why they're being asked to sell, sell the cookies is they're going to learn goal setting, decision making, money management, people skills, business ethics, and the quote is, girls act honorably and responsibly during every step, step of the cookie sale. This matters because employers want to hire ethical employees, unquote. This is what it says on your cookie box. You should look next time you eat one. They're delicious. What, we wanna, what I want to highlight, because when I first saw the cookie box, what, what really struck me, and I have an eight-year-old and she loves those cookies, is how dominant and normalized bourgeois and liberal feminism has become in this country. Okay? So this is basically, it is considered a normative part of our life that the idea of achievement is only understood on the basis of capitalist achievement, okay? So that is, the cookie is a very tiny part of that huge hole that is then going to get our girls to compete in the job market, to work as a barista at Starbucks, and to, and if our girls are girls of color, to actually clean uh, our uh, Starbucks and our hotel rooms. So this is the ethics that is being promoted in this world in a normalized manner. So what, what was so upsetting about this, and I'm sure it's upsetting to all of you, is the capitulation by this model of feminism, uh, this capitulation of the word feminism into tying it so closely to capitalism. Feminism was seen as the participation in not the questioning of capitalism. That's how feminism was uh, defined, and that that was the road out of gender oppression, okay? So, as you know, you know, liberal feminists such as Sheryl Sandberg, Hillary Clinton, is constantly talking about the glass ceiling. Of course they can talk about the glass ceiling. They have very, very shiny glass ceilings above them, but today, <laughs> The t and, and you can also understand why feminism of this brand or variety made absolutely no sense to the vast majority of people, not just of this planet, but also of this country. Because today the top 1% earn an average of $1.3 million a year. It is more than three times much as the 1980s. And we thought 1980s was the era of Gordon Gecko, right? So now today the one percent earns more, uh, three times more than the 1980s, while the bottom 50 percent of American population earned an average of 16,000 in pre-tax income in 1980, and that hasn't changed in all of these over three decades. So, 
pardon me if your glass ceiling above your corporate boardroom and your golf club does not make sense to the vast majority of women of this country and of this world. So the problem is that uh, most women are not looking up to shatter the glass ceiling, they are actually down there cleaning the basement. So this is the problem of liberal feminism that we have seen come so closely with the 40 years of neoliberalism in this country. The problem was the tying of feminism to this agenda of class power and the purpose of March 8th Women's Strike was to very consciously release the insurgent power of feminism from this vice grip of class tyranny. And this is why very consciously we called it the feminism of the 99%. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what the thinking was behind, uh, behind that because it was an international committee that uh, organized March 8th since the November of last year and mostly led by Latin American women and um, women in Poland who, who had marvelous mobilizations and that inspired an international coordination which was very, very impressive. And the US, um, in the US we played a very small part of that whole global uh, um, uh, network. So the international committee consisted of women from diverse political traditions. Some were Marxist, some were definitely not. There was a high degree of democratic debate, some sharp disagreement but underlying that there was an urgent political desire for unity in action and this is why I think we were successful to a certain extent to actually learn from each other through that process of international uh, coordination while each country around um, uh, the world it was um, March 8th was organized in over 50 countries uh, this year. So while each country had its own platform for the strike, I think there were three broad areas of coherence between the various strike committees. First, I think the project internationally had a very impressive and broad and commodious understanding of work or labor. That work that women do is often not just in double shifts anymore, but triple shifts because most women often have, the vast majority of women in our uh, world now have double jobs and after the double jobs, the third shift uh, starts of work at home, of housework and childcare and so on. So to understand what we are striking against cannot just be a strike organized in the workplace, it has to extend beyond that and have a broader definition of what women's work or women's uh, labor actually means. Second, um, while all of us sort of commonsensically and implicitly knew and agreed that women's lives had been devastated globally in the last few decades, the March 8th committee consciously recognized that process to be the result of neoliberal policies pursued by governments and institutions. This was clear. We knew who the enemy was, we knew where they lived, and some of their addresses were constantly on CNN. So, um, not everyone in the committee used the C word or capitalism as a category of analysis. However, the explanatory framework as to why our world had suddenly become very rubbish was actually firmly rooted in institutions, that we understood that it was institutions and social relations uh, arising from neoliberal policies that created this world. So it wasn't sort of individuals or um, individual toxicity that, you know, men were genetically somehow violent. It wasn't that it was social relations that created these sort of uh, situations for us. And finally, and this was very important for some of us who have uh, worked on uh, Palestine for a, for a long time, is following from this approach of locating oppression in social relations rather than the accident of individuality, the committee overall recognized that gender oppression was neither singular 
nor monocausal. There was not one cause to what creates violence in the, in the house, workplace, or sexism. And if the problem of gender, so to speak, was not simply about gender alone, then surely the solution to gender oppression could not come through a struggle around gender alone. Hence, the international committee's densely political and intensely practical slogan that we all adopted globally, which was, solidarity is our weapon. And I thought that was very, very important. So the reason I, I talk about these broad outlines is because I think that gave us the context to develop in the US, specifically the slogan, feminism for the 99%. And that's why we argued that this was a moment after uh, Trump's election when we could actually, there was a space for the left, given the vast mobilization of the Women's March, following the wonderful spontaneous mobilization of people rushing to airports, the most soulless spots of capitalism, the airport, rushing to airports to welcome uh, uh, our Muslim sisters and brothers and refugees. We thought the moment had come to actually strike a blow against neoliberal feminism and for once bring back the insurgence that feminism actually contains. And we th argued that it was for the first time in a long time we had a concrete possibility for a new powerful anti-capitalist and internationalist feminist movement for, uh, for the first time. Um, I'm not gonna take too much of your time, but I just wanna talk very briefly uh, in the um, conclusion about why we decided to make the liberation the issue of the liberation of Palestine and decolonizing Palestine very, very central to our platform. And I want you to know that that was one of the reasons why March 8th in the United States got attacked viciously. Um, uh, many of us were termed terrorists or terrorist sympathizers. Articles were written in The Nation and in The New York Times about this. And, uh, but we basically argued very strongly for Palestine to be central. And we actually argued for Palestine to, that, uh, to be the liberation of Palestine must form the beating heart of all social mobilizations of our time. Because I think one of the things that we felt was in the 1960s, it was Vietnam that was the litmus test of what the left must do. In our time, the litmus test is Palestine. And this is why... In our movement, if we are going to become fit to rule, if we are going to fight oppression, we need to understand that imperial policies is actually aiding sometimes nationalist resurgence in the sense that we can have a higher minimum wage. Capital can sometimes give us a higher minimum wage, but will not stop wars. Okay, so there will be no compromise for the capitalist class on imperial interests, on imperial wars, etc. even though if we have a strong labor movement in this country that I think we should all work to organize, but even if we have a strong labor movement in this country, capital may actually concede on a national basis some of the demands, but it will never concede to imperial interests. And this is why the question of imperialism must be at the heart of all social movements and particularly the labor movement. We cannot say, as Richard Trumka says, that if there's going to be a wall, it'd be a union wall. No. What we say is no wall and no border because that is something that our working class does not benefit from, from fighting the working class across the border from us. So this is the litmus test for the left that we need to be absolutely clear on moving forward to our, uh, to our next step as a strident, decolonized, anti-imperialist feminism is what we stand for and we are proud to. The last thing I will say is what kind of movement do we want? And we have faced a lot of alt-right, white supremacist attacks in the Midwest where I teach. 
and uh, our campuses were absolutely plastered with these fascist uh, posters. And sometimes I worry about my mixed race child walking to her public school or me going to class. So this is why I use this word consciously because they do not want miscegenation. I want to use that word consciously to say, not only should we miscegenate, our movements should miscegenate. Every union leader needs to go to a feminist meeting. Every feminist needs to learn from a Black Lives Matter meeting. Every Black Lives activist has shown us the way by uniting with Justice for Palestine. That has been a fantastic model when Black Lives Matter activists toured the country from north to south with Palestine, Justice for Palestine uh, comrades. And that is the model of miscegenated, mixed, standing for solidarity that we need to move forward in the coming age. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vidya. Thank you so much, Tithi. That was incredible. Um, next up is Chinzia Arruza. Thank you very much. Make some noise, please. Show love. So um, I'm going to talk, as you may imagine, uh, uh, again about the feminists for the 99%. But I will try not to repeat what the uh, Titi has just said, although um, this is a bit difficult because we uh, tend to think very similar things, oddly enough, and we are also even dressed the same tonight, so <laughs> this is a bit awkward. Anyway, um, I'm going to start from an article that you may have read um, that was published in The Nation in March by Catapolit. And um, in this article, Catapolit raised a very important, interesting question and uh, uh, the question was, uh, what is feminism about? So what does count as a feminist issue? What, what um, should count as a feminist issue? Uh, now, I, I, tried to, I tried to understand the logic of the article, and I came up with this reconstruction. So I, I hope I'm, uh, I'm fair enough. Um, the logic was to say, the argument was to say, well, women are you know, more than half of the humanity. Um, and uh, of humanity, of human beings, therefore, uh, potentially everything uh, concerns women. You know, women are uh, specifically affected by uh, climate change, by poverty, by racism, by war, by imperialism, uh, by exploitation, and so on. And this is why feminism must actually uh, narrow, be narrowed down to just a very specific issues. Um, that is uh, abortion rights and you know, reproductive rights and uh, uh, gender equality. Now, I spent some time on this article to try and to understand the logic. So, you know, women are affected in various ways by basically all possible issues, but this is why feminists uh, should not deal with all these issues, uh, should just deal with uh, very narrow, specific questions that count as properly feminist questions. I, I really didn't manage to find uh, the rationality of this uh, in the sense that uh, the way I understand feminism, but maybe I'm, uh, I'm wrong, is that feminism is not, doesn't have to do with uh, specific issues. This is not what feminism is about. Uh, feminism is not about you know, identifying two, three demands that are specifically feminist and around which we organize feminist movements, organizations, and so on. Feminism is a lens through which uh, we can better understand the world in which we live and through which we can better organize. Uh, it is a lens through which we can understand what capitalism is. Uh, if we do not start or we, if we do not take into account the way in which uh, uh, capitalism impacts uh, on uh, women and queer people or gender non-conform people, uh, we do miss something about the way capitalism works. We do not understand the whole, uh, the whole reality. 
um, if we do not take into account the power dynamics uh, within uh, political organizations, uh, within uh, social organizations, we, if you do not uh, take into account how, the way in which uh, gender plays a role in these power dynamics, uh, well, uh, probably we will end up with uh, very badly organized uh, and organizations with probably a very bad politics. So in other words, the way in which I have been uh, feminist uh, for all my life was to use feminism uh, as in, in the ideal of uh, uh, women's liberation, gender liberation, sexual liberation as, as a general lens that allows me to actually add to the general critique of, uh, of capitalism. But in, on top, on, in addition to this, um, Catapoli probably forgot that there is a very long tradition, uh, a long feminist, feminist tradition, properly feminist tradition, um, that, uh, that is uh, a working class feminist tradition, uh, high history that uh, had figures such as uh, Clara Zekin, Alexandra Kollontai, Claudia Jones, uh, Angela Davis, we can add many of, many of them uh, that were and are properly feminist activists, but they use their feminists precisely to uh, attack capitalism uh, as a whole, to attack injustice as a whole. Not only this, um, when we organized, uh, and, and this, we didn't do this on purpose, but uh, as, as Titi said, March 8 was, uh, was called for uh, uh, internationally by Polish and Argentinian feminists. We actually arrived a bit late in the game, and then we had to rush to organize March 8 in the States within three weeks, which was crazy. Um, but uh, uh, something that perhaps we didn't come up uh, sufficiently also in, uh, in our mobilization is that uh, this year, uh, the uh, March 8th was precisely the 100th anniversary of the February Revolution. And this is not something that uh, is irrelevant to what I'm saying because uh, do you know who started the February Revolution? Women workers. Women workers on International Women's Day took the streets of, of, uh, of uh, Petersburg and started the, the revolutionary process. So there is a long history, a long tradition of uh, women's participation in uh, social and revolutionary struggles, and it is not a passive participation, it is not uh, a secondary participation, it is a participation that has brought to these uh, revolutions and to these struggles the perspective, the per feminist perspective of women's liberation, of women's rights and sexual liberation. All of this, of course, is not taken into account by liberal feminism, but precisely this is the reason why what we want to organize and we want to, want to, what we want to give voice to is the feminism for the 99%. Um, one lesson we learned from March 8th, and I hope uh, that uh, this is uh, uh, something that, uh, uh, that we will be able to discuss uh, increasingly, is that uh, there is no, and it's not a discovery, we already knew this, but there is no contradiction whatsoever between class struggle and uh, feminist struggle. There is, not only there is no contradiction, the two things must absolutely go uh, together. Uh, in the, in, over the course of also the electoral campaign and, and uh, the presidential election and so on, we have been told over and over again, but not only by uh, liberal uh, Hillary supporters, but this was a bit uh, in the air, we have been told over and over again that uh, uh, there is some form of tension between uh, identity-based uh, organizing, identity-based struggle and uh, class struggle. And even uh, actually among the left, there are those who think that this is the case. Uh, so there are those who also told us that, uh, I mean, why, I mean, when, okay, fine that you're organizing March 8, but uh, uh, when are we going to start addressing more global issues? Or uh, when, are, when are we going to start of, uh, you know, being less sectorial, less identity-based, and uh, address more, uh, more general issues? Now, I think that uh, one, uh, uh, one lesson that we may learn from March 8 is that actually um, it is possible to articulate a feminism, uh, a, a, kind, a certain kind of feminism that is not sectorial, that is not in contradiction with class struggle, that is actually part and, uh, and, uh, and substance and, and life of, uh, of class struggle, and, uh, and that uh, uh, has as its center 
the, the fight against capitalism, against racism, against exploitation, and against all the forms of oppression that capitalism produces and that impact specifically uh, women. So, when, when does the contradiction arise? Because clearly we, we, did, we did see also in the past years that, uh, yes, there are uh, moments of clash, there are moments of tension uh, between, you know, so-called class-based uh, uh, organizing and uh, gender or race-based organizing. When does this contradiction arise? Uh, it arises when uh, there is a liberal hegemony in feminist and racist struggle for the reasons I explained. Because of course, if we take feminism to be just, uh, to, to have, uh, you know, not to, because it is not a feminist issue to deal with Palestine, or it is not a feminist issue to deal with the class exploitation, or, and we should narrow down, of course, then attention arises. But this is, uh, the problem is, is not with feminism, it's with that precise, precise articulation of feminism. So it is, uh, the problem is with this kind of liberal articulation of, family, uh, of feminism. But the, the problem and the contradiction also arises when uh, uh, we conceive uh, capitalism as a narrowly understood economic system that has to do just with the economic exploitation. And we do not see that capitalism is a form of society, is a form of life, in is, a, is a way in which human beings are currently organizing their reproduction. And, uh, and that capitalism, capitalism therefore has to do not just with exploitation, but also with, uh, with reproduction, with uh, racism, with uh, uh, ecology uh, and climate change and so on and so on. When, uh, when we have uh, uh, left uh, organizers who say, who tell, tell us that uh, we have been sectorial because we are organizing a feminist activity, this is when the contradiction arises. But I do think that uh, this is not inscribed in the history of uh, the working class movement, it is not inscribed in the history of class struggle, and uh, actually uh, the, if we look at the, at the history of class struggle from the Paris Commune to the February Revolution to the, the civil war in Spain uh, to the mobilizations of the 70s and so on, we always see that uh, the moments in which women have uh, uh, managed to uh, gain uh, more freedom, more rights, uh, more participation, more voice was within larger social mobilizations and larger revolutions. And at the same time, without those women, these revolutions uh, would have not succeeded or would have been much smaller, would have not uh, uh, have the kind of political significance that, we, uh, that, that they ha historically have. They would have uh, uh, they would have had a completely different history. So if we look at the, hist at the concrete history of the way in which uh, our comrades before us uh, fought and struggled, uh, not only we don't see the contradiction, we, of course we see moments of tension, but uh, we also see the necessity, the, the absolute necessity of a feminist revolution within uh, the social uh, revolution against capitalism. Thank you very much, Jazia. Um, up next, please uh, put your hands together for L.A. Kaufman. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to Left Forum for having me here tonight. It's really a pleasure to be here with this powerhouse group of organizers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the resistance and about the character of the resistance that has, has risen up in recent months, um, building on, on what the speakers before me have already addressed. Um, let me get a show of hands first. So, so how many of the people in this room have been to some kind of protest since January 20th? <laughs> Brilliant. I'm surprised that there's anybody not raising their hands. Um, but I particularly would like to know do we have any folks who are relatively new to, the, to our movements? Any folks who became politically active, say, since the election? Right on, we've got a few here. Um, obviously, what we've seen has been this in, uh, since uh, January 21st has been an incredible outpouring of activism and organizing. Unlike anything I've seen in nearly 40 years of of observing and being part of radical movements in this country. Um, and there's several qualities to this, this in, incredible uh, upsurge of resistance that I think are worth lingering on and talking about. Um, I mean, first of all, what we're talking about is we're talking about a movement of movements, right? There's no, there's no center here. 
This is a vast, sprawling landscape of people in motion in many different ways, with many different ideas about how to move forward, with many different voices. Um, but that said, um, we're in a lucky position. There's a lot of scholars who've been looking very closely at this upsurge. And what we know intuitively from the experience of those of us who were on the streets on January 21st at, at one of the women's marches um, has carried forward ever since, which is that it's important for us to name and to say that the resistance that has sprung up has been predominantly women that it is women who have been taking the lead in organizing the resistance to Trump in recent months. Um, now, you can look, for instance, you can look at the, at the, at the day of the Women's March, for one example. Um, there's other data as well. I mean, uh, uh, there's, um, uh, there was a study of who's been making phone calls to members of Congress um, in recent months. Uh, and the finding was that 86% of the people doing so were women. There have been all of these new formations and new apps and new ways for people to participate that have been springing up. Um, one of them surveyed their members and 92% of the newly active folks were women. Um, uh, a sociologist, Dana Fisher, went, has been attending all the big marches in Washington, D.C. that have taken place this spring. We know there's been one after another. And every single one of them has had a majority women. It was obviously most striking when you looked at the women's marches themselves. Um, but even, uh, for instance, the March for Science, the March for Science was 57% women. Um, now, uh, why does this matter? I mean, it matters uh, descriptively, but I think it matters in a deeper way. Um, the, 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 the leadership of women in the resistance is not new at all. Anyone who um, has been tracking what has happened to our grassroots movements over the last decades really wouldn't be surprised to see that what was our kickoff party for this, for this we hope, revolution, this uprising uh, of resistance against Trump was, was the Women's March. That, that's the, the, the culmination of a broad shift that has taken place since the late 60s over this course of decades in how our movements are organized. More and more, um, we have moved to a set of networked movements in which the work is being disproportionately carried by women. This has been true. There's been uh, movement after movement. You can go back and look in the 70s at the movement to stop nuclear power in this country. You can look at the movement um, against U.S. intervention in Central America. You can look at the AIDS activist movement. We think of, um, of course, many of the people who were themselves infected with HIV and fighting in the AIDS activist movement in the 80s were men, but, but many of the people who taught them how to organize and how to win were women. Women who had worked in the anti-apartheid movement, women who had worked in the Central America movement, um, women who served as bridges from one movement to the next. And we see that bridging work very much in our time when we look and see what are the precursors for to the extraordinary outpouring of organizing we've seen in recent months. We look and we see the important leadership of women there as well, whether it was in the streets of Ferguson um, or in the encampments at Standing Rock. There too, these movements that didn't necessarily take women's issues first and foremost as their focus were led by and shaped profoundly by the work of women. Now, by contrast, I think we need to say that we've seen that certain parts of the left have kind of lagged behind in recognizing the leadership of women. Um, it can be shocking, in fact, if you look closely at some of the institutions of the left, of particularly um, of our intellectual institutions, how many of them remain dominated by men um, the, 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 the Unitarian Church has a nice little slogan that they use, um, that they, uh, they talk about themselves as being dedicated to deeds, not creeds. Um, uh, and I think if, if, we, if we look, we see that you could take the gender gap that we see and who's mobilizing and out in the streets, and we can invert it when we look at who's commenting and uh, 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 who's, who's responsible for commentary and analysis versus who's responsible for organizing and carrying the, the burden of the work. It, 
why this matters, why this gender gap matters, why it matters um, that the left has, in so many cases, and particularly the, the, the intellectual world of the left, has lagged behind with what's happened in the grassroots, is because that disconnect has a political content to it. Um, it's not just simply that, that, that women are tired of sexism and institutions of the left, although that is certainly true. Um, but I think that there's, there's something that, um, that gets missed when we don't start from the perspective of those who've been working on the ground, building our movements, doing the work, carrying the load over time. Um, as someone who both studies movements and who has been part of them, there is nothing more humbling than sitting down to organize. Organizing teaches you that it's very, very challenging to make change. It, 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 it brings a sense of reality. It's very easy for us to stand and talk about the world that we want to see, and it's important and powerful that we do so. But it's also, especially in a moment of crisis like this one, crucial that we look to the lessons of those movements that have managed to win substantial and meaningful victories in the face of crisis and backlash, and look at the practices and the traditions that have been carried down from movement to movement. Um, <clears throat> the, the discipline that comes from really looking closely at organizing as a set of practices and as a body of knowledge is to understand the art of the possible and to push to the very edges of what that might be. Um, we can't say in this moment, um, I think uh, Nancy Romer did a, did, a, did a fantastic job of outlining the real sense of, of peril and crisis and emergency that we are in now. And we know that as powerful as the movements are that have arisen in recent months, they are not yet adequate to stop the damage that is coming down the road. We have managed, in some cases, to, to stall, the roll, uh, stall and slow the rollout of destructive policies from the Trump administration. But we realize, of course, that Trump is just one individual who's, who's surrounded by an entire set of powerful institutions who are looking to undermine and reverse the gains that we have made in recent decades. So as we think, as we study and learn from the movements of the past, as we face this unprecedented period of crisis, I would like to point us to the character of this resistance as embodying a set of values that have been long, uh, have been long in building. When we look at this movement of movements, one of the, besides being led by women, its most dramatic character is how decentralized it is. The extent to which this is a, a resistance that is built out of many voices, many movements, and whose central uh, challenge right now is learning how we can work together in ways that preserve that autonomy and voice. Those on the left who critique identity politics, um, who think somehow that our, our, our tapestry of movements of resistance need to all somehow line up behind one single vision, um, are, are, are going to find that people will continue to vote with their feet for movements that, pr that protect and treasure the autonomy of all who take part and who are exploring new forms of connection and solidarity. Um, we saw that um, as, as uh, uh, was mentioned about Black Lives Matter and Palestinian activism. We've seen all kinds of powerful new forms of convergence and connection around the issue of immigrant rights, around the issue of climate justice, around the issues of pipeline, pipelines and the fossil fuel industry. So as we build on what we have, which we know as powerful and extraordinary as it is, is only the beginning of the resistance that we are going to need to turn back the tide, to not just fight the damage that's coming down the pike now, but to, pro to bring about a profound transformation in our world. We're going to need all of us working together 
but in new ways, exploring new forms of solidarity, exploring new forms of connection, working within a landscape that respects the voice of all of its participants, and in particular, that recognizes the vision, the work, and the leadership of women in our movements. Thank you. Thank you, L.A. Kaufman. Uh, I would like to bring up now, uh, very, very dear to my heart, uh, powerful, everlasting, intangible spirit. Please show your love for Madonna Thunderhawk. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I don't have any papers, but I have a I have my phone with a clock on here, so I don't <laughs> can remind myself. But um, yeah, I was a little little nervous, you know, about uh, this evening because um, <clears throat> I really didn't know what to expect. Um, when I came, you know, it was, um, but I knew it was important. And yeah, I'm here to uh, talk about uh, Standing Rock, but I saw on the, the, the writing for this uh, panel about uh, resistance. And I just thought to myself, you know, at my age, uh, and what's going on, with my people back in the Dakotas, you know, I'm, I'm one of the old guys. Experienced, yeah. But it's still, our people are still, we're colonized, but we're still tribal. So when you reach the age of elder, you, it's automatic status. But with that status comes responsibility. In my lifetime, as a young mother, I was in a, another standoff in 1973 in Wounded Knee, where we were trapped in a community, regardless of what was written and what was said about it, I had my 10-year-old son with me. And we were young and rookies, naive, but we also had our history and we had our elders. And our elders had our back. So we made a lot of mistakes. We learned the hard way experience. But we never faltered because we had our people behind us. So indigenous people, over those years that I've learned the indigenous of this Western Hemisphere, North and South. We are in a struggle for survival on all levels. And when we struggle, we struggle as community. We don't have the, um, what's the word, uh, the privilege? <laughs> of separating ourselves for women's rights, women's rights, children's rights, whatever. We're in a struggle as people, as the indigenous of this land. And the key word here is land. We are the only ones in this, this country that still are struggling on, because of our land base to maintain what we have. So everything is a crisis. And what happened at Standing Rock is a continuation of this resistance and this struggle. While we were on the, at the standoff, on the front lines at Standing Rock, at the, the camp, with the water cannons and the rubber bullets and whatever else, our relatives, 
in the Amazon are being killed, literally slaughtered by those forces, militia that are protecting the oil companies down there. So this is a continuation. It isn't over. This is just another happening for us in our resistance since the invasion, since the European invasion. And when I look out here, you know what I see? I see allies. We learned that back in the 70s, the late 60s and the 70s, what that meant, that we didn't stand alone. And over the months, when the camp began, the Ochete Shakoi, in our language, that means the seven council fires of the Great Sioux Nation. Great Sioux Nation, that's the government's term for us. But our term is Ochete Shakoi, seven council fires, seven bands. So that, the camp was a gathering of, of, of our people nationwide. Our tribal government sent out a call when they found out that the company was going to just steamroll ahead through sacred sites and, and, and burial sites. The call went out nationwide to all of our people and they came from all over the Western Hemisphere they came. We had tribal people from, from Central and South America. We had tribal people from Alaska, from the Arctic, from Canada, they came. And they all brought their flags and their, their emblems to show that they were there in support and they brought supplies. And it was an amazing thing for us because every First Nations that has a land base today, they're fighting the same struggle on whatever level. Fishing rights, hunting rights, logging, water rights, gas, oil. We're constantly under, under attack from the, the energy corporations. So this is nothing new for us. It's just a continuation, like I'm, I keep saying over and over, because that's what it is. But guess what? November, this country had their election. And right after the national election, we were flooded by young people from all over this country. And most of them, non-native. All showed up at our gate. Why? Because we were the only act of resistance going on in this country when they were shocked about who got elected. What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna go? Overnight, we went from a few thousand people in camp to 10,000. So it was, a, it was a growing village of young people. And we were there, my sister and I specifically, we were, um, he was there, this young man. So he knows what Facebook Hill was. There was a, one hill there, and that's where everybody could get re reception. So they had called it Facebook Hill. Well, that's where we camped. And we camped right next to the legal collective tent because people were getting arrested by the hundreds. So the uh, legal collective was formed. And but anyway, we were there as elders to do what was done for us when we were young. Our elders showed up. Our elders stood there. They didn't tell us what to do. They didn't criticize. They didn't boss us around. They were there to support. And that's what we did. For five months, we were there. But like I'm telling you, it was a continuation of what, of what, we, do, what we go through as indigenous people in this country, where we're almost invisible. 
But our ancestors in the 1800s, when the United States government was at its weakest after the Civil War, they came to the Northern Plains and said, okay, we can't have, we can't have this uh, war going on because we can't seem to get rid of you people, can't kill you off, because this is your land and you know how to survive on it. We don't. And we're weak, so we want to make treaties with you. So Ochete Shakoi, we have treaties that were ratified by Congress. And that's, that's our foundation for any struggle we have are those treaties. They're older than any of, any of the states in this country, some of them. Especially in the western part of the, this country. But that is a uh, um, foundation for the rest of the country. For example, a few, few years ago, we struggled and, 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 and stopped the um, XL pipeline that was coming through South Dakota, to my reservation. My reservation is a Cheyenne River Reservation. We border Standing Rock Reservation. We're sister type, you know, uh, reservations. Uh, it's a historical thing too. Um, so a few years back, XL Pipeline, we put a stop to them. We had, we had uh, allies, the white ranchers and farmers in Nebraska organized just like we did back in the late 70s, early 80s, when we had the Cowboy and Indian Alliance then, and we stopped Union Carbide from mining uranium in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Nobody's ever heard about that. So again, this is a continuation of fighting these corporations in this country. So a few years ago, the the uh, white ranchers and, and uh, people uh, of the rural areas where the pipeline was going to come to and they were concerned about their water supply. But they, what was happening to them was the, the companies, the energy corporations, with the help of the, the federal agencies and the Republican Congress, were able to declare these ranchers' land uh, what do you call it? Imminent domain. But because of our treaty status, they can't do that to us. So all of a sudden, we have all these allies, all these, you know, people before this struggle, for them, they had this frontier mentality. They were still, you know, cowboys and Indians separate. But when they realize that we all have to drink the same water and breathe the same air, we better be allies for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our descendants. So allies are very, very important. And I don't know, in the academic world and in this part of the country, there's all kinds of other words you use, but we still say solidarity and still say allies. And the youth of this country is where it's at. Because when the youth get organized, change happens. And all of us gray hairs need to be standing there strong. We have your back. Now, I'm still grassroots, totally grassroots. We've got t-shirts to sell. That's what we're doing yet. I'm still there. You know, I don't have, <laughs> I'm not teaching anywhere or any kind of degrees or anything, but you know, I still, still sell t-shirts because we right now, our battles at Standing Rock now is the legal fight. Mm -hmm. They're dismissing some cases on, on, on uh, misdemeanors and they're turning around and recharging people with criminal charges. 700 and some people were arrested. So that's where we're at with the major legal battles going on. But you know, our backs have been to the wall for several hundred years now. 
So what do you do? You fight back. You stand strong. And you respect your allies. Thank you. Choni, water is life. You know, there are millions of species on this planet that can live without love, but not one of them can live without water. So when I came there, that was one of the first things that I was told by some of the young poet children. I wanted to go into the first question for the, for the panel, but since I know that, uh, that the sister has to, has to leave at some point. I wanted the first question to be about Standing Rock specifically. Uh, the question is that women were at the forefront of Standing Rock struggle. Um, and one of the things that we have been pointed out to is now we see women much more in a leading role in our, in our social struggles. But similar to the way that we see now a, uh, an increase of the videotaping of, of police violence, that doesn't mean that women's roles haven't been in that position of influence for so many times. They just haven't got the credit that they deserve, right? We were discussing this earlier about how many men of power, right? How many li literary geniuses or, or, or people who influence policy were themselves influenced by women who were forced to then take a back seat and not get the credit they deserve for the ideas that they put out, for the policy that they shaped and influenced, and for the revolutions that took place because it was their children they had to bury, because it was, it was them that stood alongside with everybody else firing. And this is important to acknowledge. So the question for the panel, and of course for the sister here, um, what do you see as the future of these young women that are coming up, seeing all of you as an example? And what, what advice would you give them um, when, they're, when they're in a position to have influence and start town a revolutionary path? Thank you. Well, in my world, and where I come from, it's, um, it's pretty basic, you know? It's uh, your work speaks for you. You don't have to fight for position or recognition, and especially in a tribal setting, it's already there. The, wom the women are the center, the life givers. Simple as that. The respect is already there. And as you go along, you have to earn that. And what you do speaks for you. So back in my day when I was young, it was totally different um, when we were, when the American Indian Movement is specifically, when we had confrontation you know, going on with the it was federal agencies, the federal government, um, there was no alternative press. There was no Native American press. There was no, uh, you know, like social media like you have today. So, for example, in Dakotas, there was just the local uh, towns and their, their media and their, their newspapers and their local TV stations, and they said whatever they wanted to say, and that's the only thing that got out. And the rest of the country picked male leadership. We had leadership in our, in our movement, the American Indian movement, wasn't the, wasn't the focus. It was a movement of the people. Wherever we were asked to go, we went. But when you have um, media in control of what people see out there, they wanted to see male warrior types, what they thought. Where's the blood? Where's the weapons? You know, we don't want to see elders. We don't want to see women. We don't want to see when they have caravans of people moving from one reservation to other, another because we've been called in. They don't want to see that the cars are full of families. 
they wanted to see, you know, oh, they're mil in our day, there, were, there was more like militants and communists. We were being led by the communists. We were, we couldn't, we were mindless. We couldn't think for ourselves. We were like adult children, but the communists were leading us around. You know, the, the, that was the media. And what happened with the male leadership is they got separated from their people by the media and the law enforcement. And they were, they were charged and you know, big, that's when it started with the, with the whole the court system and all of that kind of stuff. But things went on, the struggle went on because that isn't where the power was. The power was with the people. And the leadership was the women. But we don't have to beat anybody over the head. The results is what you worry about. You don't worry about what, what they are gonna think out there. Well, where's the women and how come they're not blah, 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 you know? That's your problem. Our problem is getting the work done. It's automatic. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, we stand here at the intersection of academia and activism within this forum. One thing that's incredibly important is the methods in which we've all decided to, to partake in this particular revolution, whether it's a revolution of the mind, whether it regards itself in one way or another. The question I wanted to ask, and it's open to anyone, um, what are the, the, the methods in which you see resistance as being the most effective in your line of work and in the field that you have expertise in? And it's open to anybody. Or the things that work the most, I guess. This is what's written here. I'll, ju I'll jump on that one. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, when I look back over, over the movements of recent decades, the ones that have won have been um, not necessarily the largest. Numbers matter, but numbers don't always matter. Um, what, what I've seen has mattered much more is, the, is precisely the kind of, of um, orientation that, that, that uh, Madonna Thunderhawk was describing. Um, it's, been, it's movements that have been persistent, that have sustained their organizing, that have been willing to use direct action, that have been willing to disrupt business as usual, and have been willing to be unpopular and to put themselves out, put their bodies on the line. Time and time again, those are the movements that have had the most success. I, I want to add to that. I agree with you, but I also think that um, part of what makes a successful movement is the relationships between the people in the movement and, and uh, uh, yeah, absolutely consistent with, with um, uh, Madonna in LA and everything that was said uh, uh, by the whole panel really. But um, I, I think that one of the reasons that uh, the men are chosen as the, the, um, the stars um, is, is um, because they can be often more recognizable. The, the media, I, I think uh, Madonna really uh, described that very well. But I think when you're in organizations, and uh, probably everyone in this room has been in organizations, you know that women are the bulwark of much of the work. That doesn't mean that the men don't do the work, the men do do the work. But there, there's, um, without being an essentialist of it, I think that women tend to be a little bit more concerned about their relationships within the organization. And I think that's really important because we have to sustain ourselves in the movement. We have to ha build movements that are our homes, our families, our points of reference. And um, I think that that's something that uh, I've experienced with women throughout my movement experience, whether it's in the feminist movement or in all the other movements that I've participated in. There's, uh, I, I've seen a lot of concern on the part of women of making it more of a family, more of a, um, a, a, a home for people to be part of. Um, and I also think that the, the relationships between the movements, very often women are those connectors, those bridges, as, as others have said before. 
And I think right now we have to do that because too often people are working in their own movements and they're not making those connections. Very often, and I think this is true, young people I totally agree are going to be you know, the, 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 the people who lead us forward on this. But oftentimes they don't have the experience of knowing how to connect to all the other movements. And I think that's something that um, women have historically done and we're gonna continue to do and men will do as well. But these are sort of basic values, I think, that um, a lot of the women in my experience have been particularly strong in advancing. So to me, um, building relationships, having respect between people, creating a kind of home base that gives people the support to move forward in the struggle, because we have to do a lot of sacrificing, I and mean, that's the reality. And we have to enjoy ourselves and feel loved and cared for and, um, uh, and finally, a, a sense of responsibility. I think that um, the fact that very often women, quote, do the work, um, is a, it comes um, as a great privilege. It's not that we're doing the scut work, per se. Everyone has to do the scut work. But I think it's a privilege to be able to do the work that builds the movement and um, uh, to be proud of that. Um, I, 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 in, the, in the food justice movement, in the climate justice movement, I see very much women's leadership. Now, it may be at the very, very top echelons that there are a lot of guys in there, and that's true. Um, not so much in food justice, maybe a little bit more in climate justice, but the people who are building the movement on the ground, creating those relationships, are predominantly women. And uh, no surprise in that, there's a long history of that. I'll just add one tiny thing. Um, first, I want to I, I want to say three things, but I want to uh, preface it by saying, since the question was asked about um, academics, I think all of us, especially those of us who uh, teach at universities, should have a healthy cynicism of the academy. Mm. And so that's the first thing I think we should be very, very clear on. Um, there is some marvelous uh, organizing going on in the universities uh, of graduate students and adjunct uh, organizing, and I think that is something that's absolutely glorious. But as for ac the academy as, as providing a lead, I think we should all have a little bit of healthy cynicism about that. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I think I want to say three things really. Um, about the current conjuncture, like what do we want to say about the current moment in terms of organizing? The first, I think, is very important um, is, um, as uh, Ludana pointed out, is the question of continuity. I think we need to say that at this Trump moment, that Trump is a sort of vicious cherry on a cake that has been baked for a very, very long time. Mm. This is not the first bad thing that has happened. The jails in this country has been filled before Trump came to power. Our schools have been starved of funds before Trump came to power. Our healthcare has been ruined before Trump came to power. So that kind of continuity, I think, is very, very important to emphasize for those joining the movement and for those of us who've been in, uh, in movements before. The second is that the night of the bourgeois uh, existence is a long one, and we need organization. We need organization as our infrastructure of protest in order to sustain us when those peaks of social movements are no longer there. We need to build infrastructure of protest, not just in our own particular sphere, but organizationally. It can be basic tools of fight back, like labor unions, which have the lowest density right now in this country, or it can be revolutionary organizations, feminist organizations, but organizations are key, and we need to have that conversation and discussion of how to build organizations. And, and, and the third, I think, uh, the last uh, thing that I want to uh, say is, we need to make the left habitable for new people joining. Th those who are coming new and getting radicalized through the movement, coming into the left, the left has to be made habitable. These are not people who are going to come here, who are going to know the uh, existing vocabulary of the left that those of us who've been here have been uh, brandishing about for 20 bloody years. These are new people, the, they're going to have new languages, and the left must be welcoming and habitable for the new activists because that's the only way 
it is going to regenerate itself and become a force in this country. I just want to say one thing, that watching the faces in the audience, um, as you're speaking, I'm seeing all these young faces and heads going up and down. <laughs> and, and I think that's a message to us that we really have to listen, that we, we, we can't speak in tongues. We have to speak very directly and honor uh, the young ones coming in. So thank you. For thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question is more of a personal, of a personal nature uh, for each one of you. Um, when you talked briefly about uh, waking people up and pushing young people towards them coming in, into activism, one thing that dawned on me is that a lot of times when people are out there trying to wake individuals up, right? Think of someone shaking you in your house at three or four o'clock in the morning your first impression wouldn't be this person's trying to help me. You would think, who the hell are you and why are you in my house at three o'clock in the morning, right? But if one of these beautiful sisters was shaking your hand and said, listen, look up, your house is on fire, the roof is burning, get you and your family out of this house, get your children, wake them up and get them the fuck out of this, excuse my language, get them out of this house. Uh, one thing that's incredibly important is that waking people up is never easy and it, people are usually never grateful for being woken up until they finally come to terms with the reason you're waking them up. And I, I know that's a very important thing about preparing the next generation. So I want to know if we could go down and, and hear a, a, a story or, or have a commentary from each one of you about that particular process within your personal experience about waking people up or seeing the difficulty in waking them up or finding the, the, the positive side when they finally do wake up and then v venturing through those channels with them as well. Whoever would like to go, I mean, please. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I don't have a specific story to share, but uh, um, my best um, um, experiences of people waking up is uh, when people woke up and nobody woke them up. <laughs> they woke them up on their own. Uh, so in other words, what, why I'm saying this, because, and this has to do also with something Titi was saying earlier, that uh, um, uh, somehow there is, uh, uh, especially the more marginal, marginal the left is, the more it thinks that uh, its task is to wake people up, up or to educate people or to teach people. Uh, about the necessity of struggle and so on. I think that, that this is a model that has never worked uh, and that, to, that we should overcome. And, uh, and that, uh, in a sense, uh, one way to regenerate the left in this country is actually to learn from the people who are already waking up. Because if we look at the, at the, at the past years, we have a, a continuous series of mobilizations and movements. Uh, from uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Occupy, Standing Rock, the, the spontaneous mobilizations uh, uh, at the airport uh, these months, uh, the Women's March, and so on and so on. So we, we did have a long series of, uh, uh, of struggles, mobilization going on and so on. And I think that uh, uh, one, uh, on the one hand, of course, we, we do have the problem of uh, uh, creating a continuity, organization, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, and going uh, beyond the simple uh, resistance to the emergency uh, and uh, actually you know, build projects, long-term uh, long projects and so on. On the other hand, we also have to learn by, you know, leftist organizers have to learn by, from what is actually happening rather than trying to fit what is happening to some kind of uh, preconstituted model. So, for example, if we, um, if, I mean, people, uh, change the way they struggle constantly. The forms in which people uh, fight back, the, form in which, the forms in which they organize, the forms in which uh, uh, they protest, are always uh, a, a mixture of uh, continuity with the past, but also uh, breaking with the past, innovating, creating, recreating the forms, recreating the, the forms and expression, and so on. So I think that what we would need today is uh, to combine together uh, the capacity for uh, continuity in organization, but also a radical uh, openness to the new forms in which uh, the struggle takes place and to what we can actually learn from the way in which people are waking up. Waking up. And very often, again, people don't, wa don't wake up because there is an organization that wakes them up. Uh, they wake up because they cannot uh, tolerate any longer 
the conditions of life that are imposed upon them because they, they, they don't have any other choice but to fight back because they think that, they, that by fighting, the fighting back is the best option in the given circumstances rather than uh, con constantly being uh, uh, oppressed uh, and, and exploded and so on. These are uh, the conditions that, uh, that, uh, um, that, that, that open, uh, open spaces for uh, mobilizations, movements and, and so on. So the task of, of organizations and social organizations in these circumstances when we, people start waking up because they cannot stand it anymore and they don't want to stand it anymore is to be open, to listen to what is, uh, uh, to what is happening and to uh, again Create a bridge with the past, with the history, with the tra tradition that uh, doesn't, you know, shouldn't be lost. But also uh, using this uh, con this history to uh, to better understand uh, what kind of novelties, what kind of uh, new forms uh, can be uh, can be created in the in these circumstances. So, in other words, what we need is uh, a 21st century uh, new uh, mobilization, movement, uh, revolution. Not we cannot reproduce the models of the past. Uh, just to say that, that um, I, you know, I've worked with students over the years um, and in a lot of different social movements, particularly on campus, and my, my own experience is th that there are very tentative initial steps. I, I haven't seen that people feel initially that they, they don't have a choice. I, my own experience is that they're more often tentative in their first steps, and that those first steps, I think, have to be greeted by real support, real organization, real honoring of that, that first step because it's a, it's a giant leap for many, many people. So I think that we really have to create very welcoming movements that do say, yes, we're, we want your new input. We want something fresh coming out of this. We need that. But I do think that um, people learn and struggle. I, you know, I, I've said this to my students over the years that you know, read, talk, uh, listen, uh, and act, because it's when you act that you really learn. And it's the struggle that brings out the deep learning, the deep life commitment. It's participating, and, and you don't participate all at once. You move slowly toward it, and then it captures your heart. It captures your mind. And all the neuroscience that shows how learning occurs shows that when you when you talk, when you dance, when you fall in love, when you march, when you chant, that's when you learn. It's not just reading. It's not just listening. That's a very passive form of learning. But it's the movement that captures you and ignites your brain and ignites your heart. And I think we have to make those movements um, very, very welcoming and supportive of people coming in. And then they'll realize that they have so much to gain and um, they're losing so much by not being in it. So I think it's a huge challenge that we have to make our movements the most exciting, the most loving, the most fun, um, and um, the most important things in all of our lives. I want to add a little bit to that and say that I think, I mean, I think, I think you're right that you can't, uh, the, 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 our movements aren't really able to wake people up to the, the conditions that, that they live in. What we can do, though, when um, we take certain kinds of action is to wake people up to the possibilities of our collective power. Mm. Um, we, you know, we live in a society mm. that, that um, uh, from, from, from many directions, demobilizes us. Um, and, and tries to make us consumers or passive participants or participants in very limited subs circumscribed ways. And that, um, I think, is, is the particular power of direct action, um, uh, the, the, the direct action at Standing Rock being uh, an incredibly powerful example that there are kinds of collective action, kinds of collective defiance that can wake people up to a sense of possibility and power. And it is incumbent on us to think about how to do that in ways that bring people in and build. Um, just to use an example to support what they're saying is what did happen 
Oh, but standing around, because you know, it was five months. Um, I use the word decolon decolonizing going on, because that, that's my world, okay? Our people are colonized. Um, all these young people came, and they brought all their, their uh, involvement, whatever they do, with them. And, and uh, we you know, sat up on Facebook Hill and watched all this happen. And they came and they built all kinds of uh, alternative uh, housing for themselves, like for, for the, because it was going to be winter, blizzards and stuff. You know, um, wind and solar and all those kinds of things. And everybody helping everybody. There wasn't the native people camped over here and somebody from Michigan all camped over here, you know. Different reservations because we are tribal and we have our, our bands, you know, of our people. Um, like the Ogallalas had a big camp stuff, but everything is open. You go there, there were kitchens everywhere. You could eat anywhere you wanted to, okay? But what happened after the camp was um, bulldozed and they, they eliminated it. That alternative type housing and that whole concept of decolonization continued on. People saw that, my people especially. So when I went home, we were talking about, well, you know, we need to, oh, I wish we could still have the camp. Well, we can. We'll call it the decolony. We're going to start a colony, but it's going to be a decolony. <laughs> and we're going to use wind and solar because we have a lot of wind back home, you know? A lot of, you know, those types of things. So the continuation of that, you know? And it all came from the young people. We said, yeah, we don't know how long we're going to be here, maybe a couple weeks, a couple months, but we're going to build this because show and tell. I mean, who does that? Young people do that. <laughs> At this time, I want to thank each and every single one of the speakers that came here. I also want to say I'm personally inspired by it, and I feel like there has been an incredible breadth of knowledge that has been shared on this stage. I want you to all stand up and please give a round of applause to these beautiful souls, these fighters, the warriors, the women. Long live the fighters. <laughs>